Well, okay. So first of all, is that we exist on all the planes at once. We are right now, we are on all the planes. We are in the material plane. Uh, we are on the etheric is the next level up. That's the plane of energy and electricity. We, and then we are also on the astral plane. That's the plane of images. So if I say to you, imagine a brown elephant sitting in the room, you will have a hard time not imagining that elephant there. I mean, try not to imagine that right now. The brown elephant is a figment of your imagination, but it exists on the astral plane because you put it there. So you just successfully conjured a brown, the spirit of a brown ele elephant because it's there in your mind. Uh, it can, you know, we can banish it, but it's there. So that's the astral plane. It's the plane of words, images. Now, when you go one level up, that is the mental plane. The mental plane is the plane of concepts. It's where math actually, you know, that's where math comes from. Uh, five fingers plus five fingers equals ten fingers. That, is, that whole concept creates numbers, okay? We express numbers in our primitive way, but that all exists on the mental plane. The mental plane is also the plane of mastery. Welcome to the Casual Temple. This week, we welcome composer and songwriter Kimberly Steele. Kimberly is located in the suburbs of Chicago, where she lives with her husband and cats. Kimberly creates gothic ethereal music and also composed her own version of the Orphic Hymns, which you can listen to on YouTube and Bandcamp. They're very, very cool. I highly recommend them. Um, so do check them out. Um, but yeah, welcome, Kimberly. So excited to have you here. <laughs> Thank you, Marilee. Thank you. I am delighted to be here on this on this night. Very, very nice to to see you again. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, uh, yes, I'm a composer, songwriter, cat owner. Right. Very true. <laughs> very important <laughs> yes. titles. Not necessarily, not necessarily in that order. I'm also a music. I'm a music teacher. Yeah. That's, that's my day job. Huh. Yeah. And I, oh, and I, I go under the name Queenie, but yeah, that's mm -hmm. me. It's just Kimberly Steele. Yeah, that's right. You're Queenie and also Kimberly Steele. <laughs> yeah, either way. I yeah. don't care. Yeah. Um, um, well, um, okay, so you, I'll let you ask the questions. Oh, no, sure. no worries. No worries. Um, yeah, we did chat before and it was very entertaining. You have a lot of really cool things um, in your life. One of the, from your very get-go, right? Your spiritual path is very interesting um, because you've kind of been a lot of things <laughs> that are really <laughs> interesting. So yep. let's just kind of dive in where you, wherever you want to start. Sure. Um, nowadays, I would consider myself a druid. I wouldn't say that there are any two druids that are alike, though. Druids are a pretty motley crew. And uh, for me, what druidry means is that I spend a lot of time in wild and semi-wild spaces. I uh, talk to trees and uh, I do uh, three of the druid rituals everyday everyday sorts of stuff uh that and that i think we'll talk about a little bit later mm -hmm. um but yeah druids are you know very very disparate they're very it's not a dogmatic religion it's uh i would call it aquarian and i would consider it more of a set of faiths than one mm -hmm. and um yeah i feel i feel that it's uh, a faith that is it's nature worship of and nature being not just these the wild and semi-wild spaces but nature being uh natural law essentially so yeah can you see the top of my head yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that's not, yeah, not that it matters <laughs> not that it matters i don't want to just be like out of the frame just because oh no you're all good yeah but anyway <laughs> But yeah, because I, uh, but I'll have to, I, I can adjust it if, if I'm looking funny. Um, but yeah, I was, okay, so you were asking about my background. I was raised a casual Christian and uh, that, what that meant was that when I was a kid, my parents took me to church and to just a very close by church. Mm -hmm. And then by the time I was in my early teens, they didn't even go anymore. And I was confirmed in that church. It was a Protestant church. Uh, 
but I found that my own interest died away as I entered my mid and late teens uh, because I used to have these night terrors and Christianity offered no explanation, no help, no, there was nobody I could talk to. And so I, that was one of the reasons there, there were certainly other reasons too, but that was the main one, meaning that I have found that in, at least in the type of casual Protestant Christianity I was a part of, that it was more of a social club than anything meaningful. And I, I just, I have a lot of disagreement with monotheism. I have, I don't have anything against it. You know, I'm, I'm very much a, you know, you do you sort of person. And I'm, I'm always happy to let people kind of do their own thing. But my issues with Christianity kind of drove me away from it. It just seemed rather empty to me. And, um, that I drove me to become a Wiccan for a while. I don't know if I mentioned that, uh, drove me, you know, towards a lot of things. And then I became an atheist for a long time. I would say about, I don't know, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was definitely more of the Hitchens quoting type rationalist, atheist, uh, materialist. I would, I would definitely say. And, uh, I was, you know, just, I was okay as an atheist. I think atheism really did help me. I do. I mean, I think I had to walk, I think a lot of, of Christian, you know, former Christians have to walk away from, from, you know, just faith in general for a while. Like I, I did, I had to, in order to kind of come back at it from a completely dis- different perspective. And that's what I did about eight years ago, I would say around yeah, 2016, maybe 2015, I, I took up the practices of Druidry. And um, for me, that was, that was, uh, it was interesting because it was about finding a new type of astral pyramid. I, I talk about this concept of astral pyramids on my blog, and we can certainly talk about those later, but uh, it might, it might take like a breakdown of talking about the subtle planes and everything else, but Mm -hmm. it's just so, there's so many rabbit holes. Oh yeah. (laughs) Um, but yeah, I mean, what, what I was uh, also thinking of, I think that one of the things that got me into Druidry was the belief, the, the allowance of the belief of past lives. Okay. So it's, I feel that my life took a turn out of atheism when I started to truly entertain the thought that this wasn't the first time I've been around. And through years of Druid practices, mainly discursive meditation, but also the sphere of protection, banishing ritual and divination, I was able to understand a lot more about my past lives uh, and just I would have, I would have flashes of them. I didn't realize I was having flashes of my past lives when I was 15, but I didn't know who it was. I mean, I had these, these flights of fancy for lack of a better term, where I would just kind of see this person and talk to them in my head Mm -hmm. and see where they were and just be able to have this entire conversation as if they were standing in front of me like scrying basically, but I didn't really think of it as such. I was like, oh, imagination. Because I had a vivid imagination, of course. I'm just like, oh, it's just something. I didn't realize until I, and now, now I profoundly believe that that was me talking to one of my past life existences. And I had a couple of those when I was like 14 and 15. Um, Yeah. Um, So that changed me. It really, it really uh, altered me and, and discursive meditation, which Uh, If I can just really quickly say what that is, it's something that is, is part of, I feel like my life's work to, to tell people about it. It's the, it's kind of, okay. It's not Eastern meditation. It's very much not the same. Discursive meditation is from the tradition of Catholicism actually. And we, we kind of trace it back to Benedict of Nursia. Uh, you know, in the Middle Ages, where he would have his monks and uh, his, you know, his people 
sit down, think about, and they, they called it contemplation. Okay. And they would sit down with one topic, one, um, one topic, one phrase, usually a phrase of the Bible. Okay. One, a picture, you know, one aspect of one picture. And they would, they would unpack that thing like a zip file. That's discursive meditation. The Eastern meditation, I feel can be, it's uh, when it's taken out of its context, um, which it usually is, tr- mm-hmm. you know, trans- transcendental meditation and so forth. It's toxic. I think I really think it's very, especially if you're a Western mind, you know, born mm-hmm. in the West, I feel that emptying your mind is the, is a great way of, of rolling out the red carpet for whatever influence you want that you do not want to come in there. It's like basically saying, hi, wandering demon, hi, uh, you know, advertiser, come on mm-hmm. in. Okay. And that's my issue with, with, uh, Eastern meditation when it's divorced from its other traditions, like, uh, yoga would be a great example, right? Meaning that there's not just the physical part, but there's a strenuous program. And there's like, you're, you're going to have to look at what you're eating and you're going to have to contemplate a bunch of, uh, scrolls. And you are going to have to have this list of things you do all the time. And that's, that's how you do it. Mm -hmm. But with, and then that's when you can do that particular meditation under a guided, under the guidance of someone, you know, usually the master, right? If and now that's fine, but when we take it in the West and we divorce it and say, oh, just empty your mind to think of, think of this stick, you know, and think of nothing else, then it's, it's effectively an invitation. It's like doing a seance and, and mm. taking roughies and bending over at a party. Right. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes I can be really hardcore. I'm sorry. I've got Pluto really, really prominent in my chart. Right. Yeah. No. So my apologies for my, like, if you're like well, she's hardcore. So. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, with discursive meditation. So you're hmm. every day you, you sit in a chair, much like this hard one that I'm sitting in right now. Okay. And all you do is you sit here, feet on the ground and no ohm, no nothing sit there and just take that one topic, whatever that is, and then sit there for five to 10 minutes every day. And just only that topic, that's the only thing you can, you, you're able to explore. But the thing is about it, let's say we do this, you know, this mug, right? You know, that mug, or let's say we do a pencil. Okay. Uh, this is a pen, but let's say it was pencil. Uh, I have a pencil right here, of course. Okay. So a pencil, uh, it comes from it means little tail, right? And it was invented, I believe, in like the Napoleonic era. I, meaning that, um, you know, I think the idea of a piece of wood and with like a, with, you know, lead in it or whatever. It used to, there used to be lead inside pencils and it's not lead anymore. So it's effectively, we think of that, we can, w- while we think of the pencil, we can think about writing. We can think about writing how, how it relates to us. You know, what are we writing, if anything, uh, mm-hmm. We can think of the wood that that made this pencil. So we can think of the graphite that, you know, it used to be lead in these things, but now it's graphite. Uh, we can think of where that comes from, where that's mined. We can think of, um, we can think of that this is made in China, most likely. And we can go into, you know, thinking of other things that are made in China. Uh, so you see how I'm saying that this one pencil is a whole world of mm-hmm. meditation. It really is. And that's why uh, it's really effective to, mer- to meditate on the tarot. Uh, in fact, I find tarot to be so overwhelming <laughs> uh, because yeah. I feel, yeah, I mean, couldn't you just spend an, you can spend an entire lifetime mm-hmm. just on one card, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just in the, in the exact process that I just explained, five minutes, we're talking five hours on one card and then you might get through one symbol. <laughs> but I don't suggest um, discursive meditation for that long a day. I mean, I started with it like five minutes a day. And that was fine. And, uh, and then it, it changed my life five minutes a day. And then it, it, I worked up to, I usually meditate for about, I would say about a half an hour of, of just sitting there. And I like to, when I do discursive meditation, I do like to write down in my notebook, like things that like pop into my head, mm-hmm. just so that way I can look at it later. And that's where I come up with a lot of my essays, actually. 
So, uh, so I highly recommend it, especially if you're a writer, but to anybody, I feel that it's, it's a lost tradition in the West and I would, I would like to see it revived. I, I would, I think it would help a lot of people. It's cheaper than psychotherapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, definitely, tra- it's definitely transformed my life. I just, mm-hmm. when I have major problems like this weekend was a little bit dramatic just some just some nonsense with uh just an old business colleague who's not he's not right in the head Mm. um but I did a lot of discursive meditation on him and and his his particular situation and it helped me to not you know to not be angry at him Mm. and uh for someone who used to have such, I used to have such anger problems. Like anger was one of the hardest things for me to deal with. It comes from, I think, being adopted. It comes from a, a lot of my anger came from my past lives. Mm. Um, you know, especially my most recent one where I was kind of an entitled uh, rich lady in my in my most recent life, uh, my past life. I, I believe I, I know a lot about her. Uh, she was a, she was born in, uh, I think like basically the late 1800s. So she's basically a Victorian lady. Her life went, uh, I believe she died in 1968. That's not a lot of time between incarnations. Mm-mm. And uh, I think that the, the last time you have in between the incarnations, the harder it is to, to when you do reincarnate. But, um, but do you remember anything about your most recent past life or? Um, that's a great question. I, you know, I've, uh, that's a great question. The most recent one I've sort of felt into was kind of in a similar situation as you. Fascinating. Um, yeah. Fascinating. Do you know if you're, I was an, I was an American. I, I believe yes. I was born on the East coast. Mm-hmm. Um, I specifically believe I was born in Vermont. Oh, and wow. yeah, and her life was spent mostly in the East Coast. She was, um, I've always been in a lot of my incarnations, I was, I've been very petite. And she mm. was, I think she was even more petite than I am now, which is really saying something because I'm 4'11. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm like shorty, shorty pants. Uh, she was very petite and she was very, you know, very pretty, but you know, she had, she was very entitled. Mm. You know, she was, um, she definitely had issues with, uh, with men. Mm -hmm. Uh, she married twice and I believe she was, I believe she was widowed twice. Um, this is what I believe about her. And she, her, one of the things that made her so angry was that she had two sons and when they grew up or not even quite grown up, they went off and fought in world war one. Mm. and they never came back and that broke her that made her very depressed very angry um and she never you know she did live a good life but Mm -hmm. she never got over that right she never did like she went to her grave in 1968 you know very very angry about that and just Mm -hmm. You know, because you know, you have two children. You you follow all the rules. You do everything. You do everything that everyone ever wants. You're the perfect wife, perfect mom, everything. And then, and their sons even go off to war like good little soldiers. Mm-hmm. And devastating. You know, she yeah. just yeah. It, it broke them. It, it broke the marriage. But I think I, I from what I recall, I, I think that the either she's widowed right after that, or or maybe she gets divorced even though that would have been scandalous or something happened so you know it 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 just I'm not clear about that Mm -hmm. I always see the second husband that comes in and uh and then she's just widowed I think she ends up widowed widowed from him and yeah that's Mm -hmm. just very odd and I believe that I saw the main flash of her when I was like 15 Mm -hmm. 14 something like that no I might have even been I might have even been like more pubescent like like 12 or 13 there's a a lot of magical activity that tends to happen around that age i mean yes if you've oh yeah yeah <laughs> yeah meaning like even if you don't i didn't even believe in it at that time right i mean i i always thought of myself what's so funny is when i was a kid i thought of myself as 
completely just oblivious to all that crap. And I, because mm. I was expecting Harry Potter. Right. I didn't realize that the stuff that was happening to me was actually that stuff trying to get my attention mm-hmm. and trying to say, Hey, stupid, you know, this is, it's us, you know, we're, this is your ecosystem talking. Um, I didn't realize that I didn't realize I was able to talk to dead people so easily. And, and there's always people like, Oh, you know, how do you know? Well, Okay. It's like, I believe I've been talking, I have been talking to dead people since I was, my gosh, like 11. I think 11 is like the first one I really remember. Wow. It was a kid who had committed suicide in my junior high. And I talked to him and then I would just, I would just talk to all these things and I wouldn't really know what they were. Uh, but I knew it was him, like the kid who killed himself because he basically said, but I didn't, because I didn't literally see it because I didn't actually see him materialize as a specter in front of me. I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm insensitive. I don't even, I don't, you know, I just basically dismissed it, Mm -hmm. you know, even though he was pretty clear about what was going on, you know? um, So I talked to my grand grandma, one of my grandmas after she died. um, And, uh, didn't believe still didn't believe i mean it's just like how, how much has to happen is right. so to a person before you're like oh good <laughs> all right <laughs> but it, it took a really long time i mean the during my whole atheist period of, of course i was um i went on antidepressant drugs for mm, like four years i would say which well maybe five years between the ages of like 17 and like 22 until uh just because i was suicidal so i was just Mm. like well either i you know slash my wrist and go jogging or i i go see a head shrinker Mm -hmm. and i you know i chose the latter um and with the yeah with with those drugs unfortunately they didn't even slow down the night terrors in fact i would say they amplified them they just made them like i wouldn't say they made them worse they just made them more clear Mm. (laughs) <laughs> mm, interesting like i had them almost I, I would say i had them like three times as much though i was like I, it started down that road i'm like oh, i'm gonna kill myself because it sucks so bad mm-hmm. and then and then finally you know and i'm just like during that whole five-year period i've I've never had such intense uh out of i don't know what you call it, astral traveling mm-hmm. but dreaming is astral traveling so i mean it's like there's there's but believe me, these, these night terrors were different. Mm-hmm. If you've ever heard, oh gosh, there's a, a documentary slash movie on Netflix where, oh man, I should remember what this thing was called, but it, it's about night terrors. And they basically interview oh. a bunch of people who have them uh-huh. and these, and I'm like, yep, I'm, we're going down like the, the checklist. We're going down the feeling of pressure all around you. Mm. You open your eyes and it's, everything is kind of red tinged. Mm. Okay. You hear pounding and or mumbling. The mumbling is the scariest part because that's the, that's the entities that are trying to get at you. Okay. Cause those are the things that are attracted to your you're, effectively they're attracted to you on the etheric plane and so they're trying to they're trying to zoom in us and nobody has a, a wilder etheric plane than a teenager it's just like you know that whole you know it's their energy is crazy <laughs> yeah um and the mind was just especially nuts and you know so we had that and then we had the uh them threatening to harm you threatening to make yourself harm you they will threaten you with self-harm this happens all the time during these astral traveling episodes. Uh, and the, oh, the impersonators, here's another one. Uh, these beings that what happens is they're, who knows who these things are? Mm-hmm. I don't even know. Are they demons? Are they just, I think they're just random critters, honestly, but they will impersonate your relatives, your friends. Um, they'll even impersonate you, but they'll usually just try to impersonate like somebody you're close to. So you think that someone's come to wake you up, but no, it's an impersonator and they do, they do not mean you uh, any good, anything good. They, mm-hmm. they definitely just want to suck your energy. They definitely want to get you into a fight. This is basically on the when I was spending all that time on the lower astral plane during these uh, antidepressant episodes of like half sleep, essentially, mm-hmm. 
it just was like open season on my poor teenage you know body mind it was just mm. open season and uh the drugs made it worse i would say mm. i would say did. and finally five years of this i'm out of college i'm like you know get i got the my my music degree by the hair of my chinny chin chin i'm like i've got to start paying for my own insurance and uh, and guess what's a pre-existing condition depression you know, major depression is a pre-existing condition. So I'm just like, screw that. I'm, I am no longer depressed. And I, I, my shrink at the time, you know, she was all about the money. So she mm. was like, Oh no, 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 you're going to be depressed forever. You're going to be taking that medication forever. And I'm just like the <laughs> hell I will. Um, and I, I weaned myself off of them. I fired her ass and, uh, you know, I would say I was, you know, still depressed, but I definitely got a lot happier after that. And mm. uh, I think atheism helped me to at least arrive at a point where I didn't care what anyone thought of me. Right. And then that that helped me to to finally uh, discover the the path of of spiritual this path of spirituality I had been looking for all along. Yeah. Yeah. So. But yeah, uh, as far as uh, one thing, I one person I wanted to mention mm-hmm. um, is who I, helped me a great deal to find my current path is the author, blogger, slash, um, I guess, mage, I guess you would call him, uh, John Michael Greer. Oh, yeah. That, did you know about him? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, yeah. he's great. How did, you, yeah. how did you find out about him? Oh, so I'll just say that I actually heard him on a podcast years and years and years ago, and they brought him on as an astrologer. And I was like, who is this guy? And at the time, he was living here in Washington, I believe. Oh. Yeah. Because I was like, wow, he's like in Washington. But I guess he doesn't live here anymore. He lives on the East Coast. Yeah. Um, so that's the first time I got to know John Michael Greer. But then like now, of course, in like your magical practice, you can't escape him. He's just so prolific he's, I th- and amazing. I he's written a hundred books, right? Yeah. Maybe not. I don't know. It's like 90 if it's not a yeah. hundred. I, mean, yeah. I consider him the J.S. Bach of modern occultism. Yes. That's an apt title. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah. I mean, I, I really, I like how relatable he is. I mean, he is brilliant, but at least yeah. I feel he's very down to earth. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would, I would love to know his his chart because that oh. that must be a fascinating <laughs> read, you know. Um, yeah. and, and not that I understand a lot about astrology, I don't, right. but I do. I, I know enough to not mistake my butt for a hole in the ground. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly Uh, but yeah no absolute he really did help me so much uh he did because i was just in this place where i didn't you know i'm just like i'm obviously looking for something i just don't know what it is Mm -hmm. and he helped me to open my mind especially as a as a former atheist and also you know the fact he was he's a druid that's i i think mm. that's why i chose that particular path because he has a book on it literally he's like this is right. how you be a druid or sort of anyway <laughs> right you know he doesn't say oh okay no you've got to be this way it's not like that but yeah he does have you know a lot of guidance where he says okay well if you're gonna be a druid you might try to do that you know those three things i was talking about the discursive meditation um the banishing and also the divination and my particular i ended up doing a lot of oh i'm a dig- divination om is this um there are these tree letters mm-hmm. uh they're kind of like runes they're real similar because isn't rune a tree letter essentially yeah or, I think just so. like each letter is like very special and so what i did is i meditated all the way through the 25 of them twice and that uh that resulted in a website um that i'll recommend of mine uh that i use i even use it myself it's called Druid Oum, and Oum is spelled O G H A M at WordPress. It's just one of those free sites, but I tried. I I I I definitely uh, I I definitely use it myself. I, I read Oum for people every week as a way of for free of, as a way of trying to improve my own uh, my own reading skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and I I get a few takers every week. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, sorry, I'm having my breath issues. I'm um I think I'm stuffy. 
Oh, oh, <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> I know. Yeah, maybe it's. I, I think the, it's um, it's warm in this room, but oh, I'm very yeah. blessed that it is. But it's warm in here. Hot flash! Oh my god. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the ledge. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I I definitely owe that guy a lot, and I actually mm. discovered him through uh Jim Constler. Mm. So that's how I found him. I found him through um constler.com i think and and okay. constler is like he used to blog about peak oil but mm-hmm. he's just a devastating wit right he's so funny i just <laughs> i love reading him um i think you were asking me about books right oh yeah if there's uh, any books along your path um that you, you would point somebody to if they were also looking you know fyi i actually loan books to anybody in the mm-hmm. continental united states i actually oh. have on my on my blog um i have a little like a blog entry and i have my whole collection of well it's no it's actually only a one chunk of my collection i've got a lot of books and i will send those to you for free i'll just look through the little list it's on my dream with blog um, but yeah, you were as because I can't just pick one. I love right. Yeah, books, I know. right? Yeah, I can't <laughs> help myself. I wish I loved books more. Maybe I would have more books. You know, I've actually I, I don't think I mentioned this. I actually I I wrote I used to, well, I haven't been writing it lately, but I used to write fiction. Mm. And I wrote this um series of vampire novels called Forever 15. Wow. I don't think I mentioned that. Nice. Yeah. I don't know. I was just I I, I don't know where the whole writing bug came from, but it's like, I would consider forever 15, like the dirty twilight, basically it's available on Amazon. Um, there's like Mm. basically three of them. There's the, the first one and there's two sequels. There used, it used to be available as a free audiobook. Um, but I, I haven't, uh, like, I don't know where that audio is. I think I could maybe resurrect it. It's just like a Mm. lot of audio because it was like a 75,000 word book. Oh. Yeah. And I read the whole thing. Like when I was, when, after I wrote it, when I, I think I wrote it when I was like 30, but anyway, but it was this interesting. It's, it's, yeah. it's like, it has twilight sort of, but I didn't, I had never, I've never actually read the entire twilight series. I don't like twilight all that much. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, I find it kind of boring, but um, mm-hmm. it's, yeah, it, it, it has like definitely like similarities in plot, but it's, it's the girl who's the vampire. Mm-hmm. She's oh. forever 15. Get it. You know? <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Um, and then I've written like a parody novel that is called Shady Light. Um, and Shady Light is a parody of it's of a parody of Fifty Shades of Grey. It's also like also kind of a parody of the um True Blood series, like the mm-hmm. Suki Stackhouse. And it's a little bit parody of um of Twilight. So because mm-hmm. Shady Light, get it. Right. So it kind of combines parodies of like those genres and it's, it's funny. Yeah. It's, it's, it's weird that book. Mm-hmm. And it's, of course I made it under a pen name, JK LMNOP. <laughs> no one gets it right. Until I say it, JK LMNOP. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it's absolutely uh, terrible from beginning to end. So if you're in the mood for something really disturbing, I mean, certainly mm-hmm. go for it. It's on Amazon as well. Um, but yeah, as far as the, my my favorite books, The Cosmic Doctrine, mm. I would credit with changing my life. And also another one by Dion Fortune, um, Through the Gates of Death. Uh, that absolutely altered my life. Uh, she, she had a good way of... See, The Cosmic Doctrine is a super confusing book. And for yes. a while, there was a discussion of it at Eco Sophia. Without that discussion, I don't think I would have had a snowball's chance in hell of no of like really internalizing any of it. Mm. You know, it is a very dense book. It is mm-hmm. it's like every single line you have to put into discursive meditation. And if you don't, if you're not already meditating, good luck to you. Um, though he, John Michael Greer has a has a book discussing that, and I have it in my collection, and I'm certainly well willing to lend it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's basically it's like a re-edition of the cosmic doctrine with a discussion and I highly recommend that book. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and then as far as, um, other books, it, I know it sounds like a boring title, but the Rosicrucian Cosmo conception by Max Heindel, mm-hmm. um, that is a very good book. Uh, Rosicrucianism is very interesting. They're Christians, but they believe in reincarnation. 
uh they they're definitely like christian occultists mm -hmm. and, and dion fortune was a christian occultist mm -hmm. uh she was anglican i guess uh and actually as far as uh Rosicrucian Cosmo conception, that's where I got the idea for one of my essays. I wrote an essay about Pollyanna and this idea of the glad game, which where, where I'm talking about uh, Pollyannism as being the true occultism, meaning being able to, to look on the bright side as much as this sounds very hokey. And I realized mm. that, that, um, you know, I just sound like a total cheese Lord most of the time that looking on the bright side trying to see the good in something is actually the most occulted aspect because it's so easy to see the bad we're we yeah. are ev evolutionary evolutionarily wired to not only to see it be at, be, see bad things but also to remember them mm -hmm. and, and when we think about it of course we are right because you have to you have to recognize threats you know, if you're running across the savannah being chased by, it's always a lion, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe it was a mammoth, right? Yeah. Oh, wait, did humans coexist with those? I don't, I, I'm sorry. I don't know my, <laughs> I don't know my prehistory. You know, so no, yeah, that's right. Cause humans did use to hunt those. So, okay. So human is being chased by somebody. You've got to remember what that felt like. So you avoid it in the future, right? You have to remember what it was like to, um, you know, accidentally burn yourself with the, the fire that you had just invented five minutes ago, being mm -hmm. a caveman and all, you have to remember what it was like to burn yourself. Otherwise you are just going to just burn yourself up. That's it. Right. And then the human race all gone, you know, story over. Right. But the problem comes when you spend a mostly sedentary lifestyle here in cute little house, <laughs> And then your mind just starts eating itself, right? Mm -hmm. This is when we turn to Western discursive meditation, right? This is exactly when, but seeing the, seeing the bright side is very, very, very difficult, especially when you're kind of in a mollycoddled situation like me, you know, where I have it cushy and soft. I'm going to take a hot bath tonight after I work out mm -hmm. on my little machine, my, my bike that goes nowhere. It's a metaphor for life. It, it's a bike you pedal really you go faster nothing happens it's, right. it's uh, yeah it's a very apt metaphor right definitely something to meditate about but anyway but you know i that is a very cushy existence like i'm probably gonna eat some chocolate chocolate comes from really far away it comes mm -hmm. I, I think that this was like what these chocolates were you, you know uh i think they're european and then i you know i'm gonna assume that the the, the chocolate itself came from Africa, you know, probably, or, you know, somewhere else. I can just eat these things. I can go to the grocery store and just buy these things. Mm -hmm. Roman emperors could not go buy that. A, they, they didn't, it didn't, they didn't have grocery stores. Right. <laughs> they would have liked them, I'm sure, but they didn't have that. They didn't have chocolate because it hadn't been discovered yet. You know, uh, it hadn't been kind of like borrowed, appropriated. Um, they didn't, they, they certainly didn't have you know, that kind of refined sugar. They didn't have airplanes like bringing it over in ships. They didn't have, so I can either see, you know, I can either, it's funny with the negative. I can either look at that chocolate after I ate it and feel all crappy for eating it. And like, oh my God, my diet. And, <laughs> and like, oh no, I'm going to gain like five pounds and my butt's going to be bigger than it is. And oh my gosh, you can either go into a whirlwind right. of negativity over the one chocolate or like, let's be, let's face it, half a box. Okay. <laughs> let's face it. You know, um, you can either go into this like tizzy fit over that, or you can actually just, just say to the gods, thank you. Mm. That was so nice. And yeah, I overdid it a little, but whatever. Um, <laughs> wasn't you know wasn't meant to be that size anyway <laughs> you know I mean just yeah and I, you know and I also have a I have a saying that I, I would like to say to all the young young women out there mm. oh honey if you don't let go of pretty by the time you're 40 it is going to eat you alive and actually I could say that to a lot of young men too yeah <laughs> oh honey yeah I mean just I feel like, uh, especially I'll see Instagram, well, Instagram's mm -hmm. an old hat now, TikTok, 
it's just so not worth it. And I see there's so much with, with people surgically altering themselves and like, no, no, yeah. no, no. And they're pretty to begin with. And I'm I like, know. You it's look sad. fine. I leave know. it alone. I know. Leave, <laughs> it, leave it, leave it. I want to see what you look like with wrinkles. You're going to look so awesome with wrinkles. Just let it happen. Oh, honey, let it, let it happen. Let yeah. it happen. I'm, I'm going to let it happen personally. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm just, no, it's not worth it. It's like, I, 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 I don't like pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and the pain that they have to go through, you know, and I'm not just talking deprivation. I'm talking about actual pain, meaning like people who have, uh, you know, just thing, things shot into their faces and mm -hmm. oh my gosh. And it's just like that, unless you've got some giant carbuncle or some just cancer <laughs> right. skull, I'm just like, no, just leave it alone. You're it's fine. You look, beauty is so in the eye of the beholder. Yes, for sure. It is like, as far as like the, the current trends of like the way, oh, you should have a, a small straight nose and a pointed chin and this, that all goes in and out of fashion so mm -hmm. fast. And then, yeah. and then they get the weird sucked in cheeks and the, and whatever they're doing, you know, with the, the eyes being so like this or whatever, you know, you and me, we're both half Asian. We're like, yeah, we're already there, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe people get eye that eyelid surgery. I know. Oh my gosh, you and I both have lidded eyes. It's not that mm -hmm. great, people. It's not that great. <laughs> Leave yeah. it alone. You want that. Believe me, you want that extra. It mm. looks cute. Stop. Yeah. You look nice. <laughs> oh, it's in the eye of the beholder. So if, yeah, just yes. let it go. It's mm -hmm. like, I see older people, I'm just blessed to live in a, in a neighborhood where older people just let it happen. Yeah. Women, men, we, they all let it happen. And their faces are wonderful. Yeah. I can't say that they're like sexy. I don't want 65 year olds to be sexy personally. But, <laughs> okay. But they're, they're not, you know, they're not necessarily sexy people. Okay. They're right. not like, um, they're not going to make the cover of a magazine anytime soon, but they have character they have they're think of like old trees mm -hmm. have character right and the old trees are wrinkled and they're gnarly and they're definitely they're they're not the sexy trees <laughs> right right they just but they're beautiful yes and i want to sit under the not so sexy tree man i do mm -hmm. oh which brings me to talk about mm -hmm. uh the druid tree ritual Oh yeah. Yeah. This is a really good thing to do. Um, especially again, I'm, I'm hoping that we're reaching the, the young people. Uh, okay. This is all you do. Oh, oh and young people. I have a TikTok channel. It's called white witch of the prairie. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, I really don't like TikTok, so <laughs> I post rather infrequently, but, um, yeah, well, it, but yeah, it, it exists. White witch of the prairie. So, um, you go out to a tree uh if if nothing in you says no I mean if you don't hear if you don't have an instant feeling of get away from here the tree is saying yes essentially okay it's going to take you a while to be able to actually have the like the conversations i have with trees but you're going to feel something and so what you're going to do is you're going to go up to the tree say hey tree i'm going to sit down do my thing and then you sit down with your back to the tree you can either lean with your back to the tree or sit down on the ground with your butt on the ground. And either way, you're going to feel, I believe this is what you're going to feel. You're going to feel a rush that I feel a rush that goes downward into the ground. It's very intense. It feels like I'm, for lack of a better word, I'm a computer and I'm downloading into mm. the ground. And then what it, after a couple I don't know, 30 seconds to a minute or two, I feel the tree's essence rush into me. It usually happens a little bit slower than my, than my essence when it goes whoosh. Mm -hmm. I feel humans, we move faster than trees. You know, we're smaller usually. You know, we, we definitely have a more frenetic pace mm -hmm. and trees will fill us with their slower energy. And this is very, very beneficial. It's beneficial for the tree because the tree gets that rush of we're like i wouldn't say we're cocaine i would say we're more like caffeine for trees mm -hmm. right yeah our energy is more like oh well pick me up mm, that's that's, oh, that's some good stuff like chocolate <laughs> you know, it's mm. like nice nice little pick me up 
And whereas with their energy, it's tree energy and it's much more calming. It's much more, well, it's more sedentary, you know, yeah. but it's, it's definitely a different perspective. And that, and that is a sort of perspective I think is very, very beneficial. It's a, one you cannot get unless you make that physical contact with a tree. So I'm going to highly recommend that. And the, once a day is, is not too much. I, I've done it. Like if I go to the forest preserve, I'll usually do it like twice, two different trees. Wow. Yeah, definitely give it a shot. It is mm-hmm. definitely worth it. Um, I definitely do it in mostly in more, more fair weather, but I'll do it in all weather. It just depends on how, you know, uh, how, how I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as my everyday, uh, practices, like that, I wouldn't say I do that, that tree ritual every day, but I do do some things every day. I do the sphere of protection every day. Uh, it is a banishing ritual. I have a video on it. Um, it's at my white witch of the prairie YouTube and at my TikTok. Um, I, I usually do that in the morning after feeding my cats. And then I do discursive meditation for about 10 to 30 minutes. And then after that, I, it, you know, uh, unless I'm really, really pressed for time, I do a three card OM reading for myself. And that's about it every single day uh, with, with extreme regularity. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, I am, if anyone could tell, uh, I am autistic. I, I'm not, I've never been diagnosed as such. I think mm-hmm. I was an autistic long before it was cool, but my particular kind of autism used to involve going into catatonic trances, which were not terrifying for me, but were terrifying for people around me. Mm-hmm. Um, it didn't happen very often, but I, it happened a, two or three times. And uh, um, that was just my form of what happens was <laughs> I went so deep in thought that it basically took a search party to get me out. Oh, right. <laughs> um yeah and I've always had that ability to to see in my mind's eye that's why Mm. that's why I think I took it so so much for granted when I was having these weird visions of my past you know past lives uh when I was 14 and 15 Mm -hmm. um one of the other one that I the other vision of the past life I had at more like I was 15 maybe like going on 16 was of my past life as a court jester. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> singing, a singing court jester. Uh, he could fart on command. Wow. That is a talent. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was a thing back then. Um, <laughs> you know, you just had to have more than one talent. <laughs> he wasn't a juggler. This is clear. I mean, he mm-hmm. there, he was more of a comedian guy and you know, he sang music was part of his, his comedy. Hmm. Yeah. So that was interesting, but yeah, the, the, the juggler or no, he wasn't, no, he didn't, he didn't do that. No, but he, <laughs> just, just comedian. But, just um, comedian. <laughs> yeah. Mainly uh, he, his life ended. It's so funny how I remember more when a past life ended violently and he mm. ended up being hung in the public square because oh, no. he slept with the wrong person's daughter yeah whoops yeah whoopee <laughs> those yeah, were those good, times but um yeah and of course i could be wrong i mean the one thing the reason why i'm no longer atheist because is because i always said i could be wrong mm. i don't mm-hmm. need to be right you know maybe yeah. i'm gonna cry in the christian hell for believing in uh you know spirits and ecosystems and talking to the dead and all this but mm-hmm I, again, if I'm wrong, I don't want to be right. I really don't. I, yeah. I'm willing to accept I could be wrong at, at any point. And I think that if, if these monotheists were willing to accept the same thing, then maybe we would have more of a conversation with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel mm-hmm. like they're not willing to even go there. And that's called intellectual honesty. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I, I have my doubts, of course. It's just that that is not going to be, I'm not going to allow those doubts to be used to be recruited into someone's toxic astral pyramid. Right. Um, right. And, and that, um, I think you were, you would ask me about that and, uh, okay. So I have a couple of essays and, and TikToks about the different planes and, mm-hmm. um, do you have any uh, of your other guests who've talked about like uh, subtle plane stuff? 
Not necessarily maybe to the extent, well, I've read your blog entries and they're very Aww. great. Um, Aww, not to the extent that you've explained it into the detail. And so I'm really excited for you to talk about oh, sure. that. <laughs> Well, okay. So first of all, is that we exist on all the planes at once. We are right now, we are on all the planes. We are in the material plane, obviously. Uh, we are on the etheric is the next level up. That's the plane of energy and electricity. We, and then we are also on the astral plane. That's the plane of images. So if I say to you, imagine a brown elephant sitting in the room, you will have a hard time not imagining that elephant there. I mean, try not to imagine that right now, okay? The brown elephant is a figment of your imagination, but it exists on the astral plane because you put it there. So you just successfully conjured a brown, the spirit of a brown ele elephant because it's there in your mind. Uh, it can, you know, we can banish it, but it's there. So that's the astral plane. It's a plane of words, images. Now, when you go one level up, that is the mental plane. The mental plane is the plane of concepts. It's where math actually, you know, that's where math comes from. Meaning mm -hmm. uh, five fingers plus five fingers equals 10 fingers. That is a, that whole concept creates numbers. Okay. We express numbers in our primitive way, but that all exists on the mental plane. The mental plane is also the plane of mastery. Um, let's take my existence as a musician. Uh, I was born with something close to perfect pitch. I was adopted to non-musical parents. I was obsessed with music from a very early age, extremely obsessed with it. I, my first song I made up when I was like four. That I believe was a mental plane skill built up over many, many lifetimes because the meat, the meat world skill is stuff like playing the piano and, pl and playing the guitar and mm -hmm. like physically getting the breath to sing or whatever. That's meat world skill. The <laughs> etheric plane skill, um, that tends to be more, more in performing when you can make people excited by your performance. Um, when you, they feel you're, you're fun to watch or whatever that's etheric. Okay. Music is very much an etheric phenomenon because it's, it's energy essentially. Mm -hmm. And it sound is just energy. And so that that's why uh, it's what makes music exciting, but what actually, you know, as far as the, the images of music uh, where that, where that's concerned, well, those tend to be how music congeals into certain forms. You know, it's going to take the form of, you know, a bunch of, this is percussion, right? And then, you know, if I, ah, 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 you know, if I string some notes together, it's like a, the beginning of a tune or whatever, that's on the astral plane where we're trying to organize the stimuli, essentially. One plane above that, we have the mental plane and that is where the music originates, right? That is the, often as a composer, I talk about this continuum and as a musician, all musicians that who train have access to a continuum that I believe exists separately from us. Um, when I it, when I write when I write songs, yes, part of it comes from me. I mean, part of it is original to me, but there is part of it where it is I'm accessing this band of it's like a radio channel, and I swear, like um, I'll have to try to do a podcast or a live stream of this someday. Where if you give me like five notes, I'll just make a tune for you. And when I, when you do that, um, and if I had my guitar, I mean, I would do it right now. Maybe, maybe we can do a future podcast or something. You know, I'll just like make up songs or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sure. Um, but at any rate, I can pull it. You say you give me five random notes and I will just make up a song for you. Okay. And it's not even hard, but that's, it's only after a lot of practice, I'm able to do that. A lot of messing around jazz, jazz musicians can just you know, like that, they can do it easier than I can. J.S. Bach, he would write fugues, four-part inventions, okay, four-part counterpoint. He didn't even need you to tell him five notes. You know, he, he, he would just, you know, he'd take the five, you know, five letters of a name, whatever. We got a fugue because it exists on this continuum and the skill is the way you, the, when you build enough skill, that is you being able to to get a basically you're buying yourself a radio mm -hmm. in order to get to the get to the continuum it's like you can't get it without the radio and you can't get the radio without skill 
And that's kind of how I see it. And that is the mental plane that that band, it's not spiritual necessarily. It's more mental Mm -hmm. and one level up is the spirit. And that I don't truly, I can't understand it because I'm just, I'm not that, you know, I don't think any human can, but that's like where gods are. Mm -hmm. That's where angels are. And so another way I like to explain it is the, I've got two different analogies and one is a, is either of the everlasting gobstopper or, or, you know, those bumper stickers where it's like the picture of the people, the stick people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Physical meat world plane is that bumper sticker and it's like this crude depiction of like people right and it goes on the back it's like a cling film and it goes on the back of the mom van right so there's that that's meat world that is its meat world existence and that's the first plane the second plane that exists on is the etheric the fact it is sticky and that's its energy that is its etheric properties right okay the third the third thing about it let's say that it has these stick people now think of everyone that is going to going to like be you know stopped in back of that and they're in every every human that sees it who can actually understand it because animals they don't know what that means right Mm -hmm. but people who look at it images will form in their brain they're like oh yeah that guy or that guy has a wife two kids a dog and a bird okay because that's what is crudely depicted and so they're Mm going to see the image of these like people whether it's real or not you know you know, that person could be lying. Maybe that's not even a mom band. You know, I don't know. Could be a serial killer. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> Trust no one. Anyway, <laughs> but, you know, so the people, people are going to see that they're going to have emotional reactions too. Some are going to be like, that is stupid and ugly. I hate it. <laughs> the Another person, oh my God, that's so cute. <laughs> right. Even mm-hmm. a picture of their bird. Is, right. Is a stupid person. right. There's just going to be all these reactions to it. That's all astral plane stuff. Okay. The and an, any animal looking at it doesn't care, okay. They they will not astrally react to it, okay. Mm-hmm. Only the people will. Then on the next plane is the mental plane, and that is the concept that created the car, uh, that's driving around. You know, mm-hmm. the idea of transporting yourself in a motorized vehicle. That is the concept that created the idea of stickers. The the concepts behind family. All of the concepts are are on that plane, the mental plane of mastery. And so bring it back to musicianship. Mm-hmm. I believe that my first foray, as you, if, if you will, into music in general was as what they would call nowadays, a re- I was retarded. I know, oh, we're not allowed to say that word. Well, I'm bringing it back. <laughs> um, when I was this is just in one of my past lives mm. uh, hundreds of years ago i w- i was disabled you know developmentally disabled and i had a very patient father and he taught me how to recognize musical intervals note by excruciating note think like he- helen keller mm-hmm. sort of stuff okay meaning just a child who was very willful just didn't didn't really have anything else that could be developed really you know, right. cause this child was, this is in the days where they would just put you outside and let you die as a baby yeah. and his patience, his patience, I think was, that's the reason why I'm relaunching the Orbit Chems, why I have those abilities mm-hmm. as the, that is what little did he know that, uh, one day that the, the child that was reborn and reborn and reborn yeah. would eventually after a very long time and a lot of different lifetimes, including being executed and dying as a singing sailor. And uh, did I tell you about that one? Mm-mm. Ah, oh yes. Okay. <laughs> I was a singing sailor. I was from Portugal. I was a short little guy. I had no prospects. I went off to sea, went off to sea as believing in the, in the Christian God. And I died at sea as an atheist. <laughs> Cursing mm. God. Wow. But all along, I, I, I sang, I sang a lot. I believe that the Orphic hymn from Poseidon, the Orphic hymn to Poseidon is actually one of my old songs from him. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, it just, it, it, it was like a little bit of a sea, a sea song, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, 
So uh, with astral, okay, we were talking about astral pyramids. Okay, mm-hmm. so the astral being the plane of imagination right. and the plane of of images, okay? We all, everyone's got an imagination. It's like um, everyone has an opinion. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> everyone has an imagination. And with our imaginations, we create these things that are sometimes called egregores, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we call those egregores. Uh, thought forms. Thought forms is another way of saying it. Mm-hmm. It just means a bunch of combined imaginations create something that can affect the material plane. Sometimes it just stays in the realm of imagination, doesn't do anything. But sometimes it can be, have profound effects on the on it causing us to do things or recruiting us to do things. Right. Any um yeah any given structure um uh, is like a, any corporation that is an astral pyramid. Mm-hmm. Any church astral pyramid uh there's always one per usually one person at the top who has a vision and they do something about the vision and they draw recruits for the bottom of their pyramid mm-hmm. um any uh, fa- uh so families are astral pyramids because the whole concept behind them is to create like a a, a unit and with the kids being the bottom um and the you know the husband and wife usually one is more dominant at the top um there are definitely astral pyramids just like my blog is an astral pyramid beware (laughs) Uh, (laughs) even uh, a casual temple that's an Mm -hmm. astral pyramid concept of one person there's lots of listeners are the bottom of the pyramid i mean they're not inherently positive or negative right not at all in fact we wouldn't have uh any motivation to kind of do anything without astral pyramids we've always got to be building them because they're one of the primary shapes of the of the astral plane Mm -hmm. um you know it's just like try to do something without using a circle in nature you know good luck to you right Right. it's just a shape that that works you know right we're we're just going to use use what works and uh the book i'm working on that i've just recently completed the first draft of sacred homemaking talks a little bit about the astral pyramids, but mostly sacred hope making is about creating shapes on the etheric and the astral with mm-hmm. the help of the divine, which create a, a protective structure that obviously unseen, there's not mm-hmm. just, you know, meat world is only the beginning. <laughs> right. <laughs> meat world is just an illusion. Mm-hmm. It's not real. It, it seems so heavy and so real. And believe me, I feel it. I do. Especially I'm 50. So right. <laughs> <I hate world. laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I, 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 especially since I'm such an idiot and I like walked six miles two days ago or three days Oof. ago. And oh my gosh. I cannot do that. It's too much. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's a lot. I yeah. felt it, like my back. I was like, um, luckily I had one of those like corsets that for like mm. sucking in your gut mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> and I put it on and it was really a good back brace I was like I'm so glad I have this <laughs> keep me it's like I bought it for fashion but then used it for <laughs> support um but it worked it was like okay let's cinch it mm-hmm. <laughs> um but uh, as far as, uh, yeah, you were asking me about etheric hygiene and sacred yes. homemaking is a part of uh, etheric hygiene, essentially. The etheric plane being the, the feng shui plane. It's That's the same thing mm-hmm. that feng shui is. And that's what uh, Chinese medicine treats. And it's what Ayurveda treats. Um, some, you know, some of this elect- it, this electrical plane is perceivable by us. Again, music that's etheric and pheno- it's an etheric phenomenon. It's sound. Sound is definitely etheric. Uh, so that that is very obvious, right? We hear sounds. There we go. Uh, we see light. Light is etheric. Electricity, also etheric. But also the vibe when you an- enter a room and you feel like, oh, this is a good vibe room. Mm-hmm. This is a bad vibe room. That is etheric right? That is the right. energy plane. And when you talk to your surroundings, you're, you know, and when you're crazy, like I am <laughs> good kind of crazy. Yeah. Good. When you thank everything, when mm-hmm. you, when you begin to appreciate everything around you, it's going to talk back. And I don't mean to freak anyone out here, but it is going to talk back to you because if you're ready to listen, you are going to hear it. I mean, not going to hear it literally. I mean, actually, right. are you clear audience? I am, uh, yeah, but it's more like in the mind, clear audience. It's like sometimes it's half. Sometimes I yeah. heard like music, 
uh, when I was a kid, I used to hear like this spectral music. And I was like, whoa, you know, trippy dude, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I've heard it sometimes when I when I was an adult. And then every now and then I'll get a little bit. But I mean, for the mm. most part, the life of an occultist is very staid, very mm-hmm. boring. At least this one says. I've only seen a full body <laughs> apparition once. And then finally, when I did, when I was finally ready to see it essentially, it was like a nothing burger. Right. <laughs> I was like, oh, they'll look like a guy walking in the forest. And then I looked and the guy disappeared. Ooh, you know, it's like mm-hmm. my former edgelordism about it. Like I had to be proved to me. And I was like, prove it, spirits that you exist. It's like all that just went went the way of the dodo. I'm just mm-hmm. it just exists. It's here. It's it's not a big deal. It's yeah. I was blind to it. Just because I'm blind to it doesn't mean it's not there. Mm-hmm. Of course it's there. It's just, you know, gravity, I don't understand it completely, but it's definitely there. I'm yeah. like, oh, you can prove gravity. I can't prove gravity on Mars. I'm not going there. Mm-hmm. I can't prove that it exists there. What if it's different there? I don't know. You know, I I mean, I've, we can't even, you know, we can't prove natural law anywhere else. I just know, you know, my immediate experience. Plus it's meat world's an illusion. So there's that, mm-hmm. but, um, but either hygiene, what I suggest, there's three different practices and I will suggest these in my book. Uh, this, this will be part of sacred homemaking. Number one is uh, go ahead and do this thing called the, the three house walk. So if you think that, oh, I'm insensitive, I can't feel anything about the etheric plane, I'll never get it. I'm just going to like scuff across the carpeting and zap you. You just <laughs> experienced the etheric plane. There it was. Um, and or I'll play a song and there you go. Etheric plane for you. But so you walk in your neighborhood and you have to do this outside. You cannot just do this virtually on Google Maps or whatever. Mm-hmm. You go out in the world and then you in a neighborhood that you like. And then you, you find three houses. Okay. Like as you're walking, you don't have to go knock on their door. Don't do that. That's creepy. But just as you walk by observe one of the houses that you're going to choose is going to be one you would move into point blank tomorrow. If someone just like gifted it to you, you're like, no, I'm there. I'm going, I'm living there right now. Okay. That's the one that has like the best vibe. Okay. Then there's a, there's going to be one that's like sketchy. You do not want to live there. Okay, you just do not. It's ugh, just gives you the heebie jeebies. And then there's going to be one that's in the middle. Okay. And then when you get home, it, you write in a little journal about those three houses and you write what your impressions were, why you had those impressions, why you think, you know, maybe you had those impressions because of memories of, of older houses. Maybe you have lived in houses like that. You know, maybe, maybe there's none of the above. I don't know you. You know, I don't know your business, but you're going to write about those houses. You're going to make notes, you know, however you make notes. And that is your three house walk. And that is teaching you how to sense things on the etheric because everything you had, you, you had to filter to any, a feeling on the etheric. Okay. So that Mm -hmm. when you got closer to that house, that was your etheric plane experience of the house, you know, so you had to make some, some notes about how you perceive those houses on the astral, but really what you were feeling is while you were standing right by the house or walking right by it, that is th- those like, Oh, that's skeevy. I don't like that place. That is 100% etheric. Mm-hmm. Cause can you really explain, Oh, well, the yard was ugly and stuff like that. You can live with an ugly yard. That's not going to be a, a complete deal breaker. You're going to be fine. I'm talking about this is just your first impression, you know? So mm-hmm. if you, oh no, you moved into a house where they, it was kind of ugly and, and you know, all the, uh, one thing I, I should mention, all the houses have to be livable. You can't be like mm. picking the house. That's like a total, <laughs> that gives me a bad feeling. Of course it does. And you have to pick something where it's, it's presentable enough, but it gives you a bad feeling. Okay. So anyway, um, so that is the first exercise I would do if you want to sensitize yourself besides just thanking everything, besides just thanking um, the desk and thanking the bed that you slept in and thanking the door, besides thanking everything, th- do the three house walk. Mm-hmm. Then there's the clean one corner exercise. So what you're going to do is you're going to take like one corner of your house that's kind of looks kind of bad, looks like bomb headed or whatever. You're going to take a little snap of it on your device or phone or, you know, whatever, yeah, you're just going to basically take a snapshot 
And you're also going to observe how it feels. Okay. Meaning like, you're just going to say, yeah, I feel meh when I walk by this. It just, I'm kind of upset when I walk by this or eh, I don't really feel anything. It's just kind of neutral. Okay. Then you're going to clean it. Okay. You're going to elim eliminate any of the stuff that you don't like in there. You're going to organize it. You're just going to go to town on it. And then when you finish it, you're going to get like one decorative item or two. I don't care. I don't know you. Again, I don't know your business. I know you, you might decorate the whole thing. I don't know about you, but you're just going to like put one, at least one decorative item. That's just surely, surely impractical. And you're going to put it there and then you're going to re-photograph it. And then you're going to observe your feelings about it. And I bet you, you are going to feel a lot different. It's going to have mm -hmm. a different vibe. It's going to have a vastly different vibe. And, and that is the space, believe it or not, that it's talking to you. Right. You know, it doesn't seem like it didn't walk up to me and start ta talking to me in plain English. Of course it didn't. <laughs> right. That's not how any human being learns. Okay. That's not, it's, it's just not, that wouldn't help. Okay. Mm -hmm. It would do that if it would help, but it's not going to help you. So that is going to be another way of sensitizing yourself. And then the third way is the, the clean toilet challenge mm -hmm. where you will, um, religiously clean your toilet every day. Uh, what I do is I take these, uh, I have a bottle of like half vinegar, half water, a little, little dash of Florida water, which is just like this cheap cologne that gets used in hoodoo magic for some reason. And sometimes I actually just take like whatever perfume I have, ha have left over from, you know, whatever from body wash or whatever, or perfume. And I actually spritz that in there just cause I like the smell. Mm -hmm. I'm not fancy. So that's why I clean my toilet with this kind of vinegar water with some perfume and a little bit of alcohol in it, essentially. And then I just go from basically the top to bottom. I do like the top of the tank and then, you know, I do the tank and then I do the, like the outer part, including that, that little doohickey on the bottom that always gets all gross. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That thing. And like the, I, and when you first do this, you're going to have to, you're going to be like so grossed out the first time <laughs> you do it. But actually it's like the second and third time. It's like, it's so awesome because you have like this beautiful immaculate toilet anyway. And then you're going to clean the seat. And then I always finish with the bowl, like with a brush. Mm -hmm. and, the, and then I, you know, I do a, like a final wipe and then I flush it a few times just so I get the gunk. It's disgusting. So, um, but I feel that it's a, it's a practice from Japan. Well, it's common in Asia, actually. It's like, it's, it's a super quote unquote superstition in Asia. Mm -hmm. Um, the the guy who may who started Honda out of a shack believed in it uh, so much he believed he basically credited cleaning his own toilet with his incredible success and he's not the only successful businessman to have made a lot of money <laughs> um, and I I believe it's helped since I started doing it in like 2023 I believe that the toilet challenge has I I think that my finances are better. Mm. I've always had a kind of bohemian existence and, uh, it hasn't been, I've been able to afford to eat out lately <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and, and, and not fancy or anything. I'm not saying that it isn't, you know, it's Panera still, but that's, that's really a step up for me. It mm. is like for me to be able to go out and have like a, a burger on the town. That's, that's a big deal. That's yeah. a big deal. Like it just, I, it's, it's, it's very meaningful to me. So, um, mm. I think it's working. And, and you just do this to your toilet every day. And I tell you, your toilet will thank you. You will feel your toilet thank you. And I usually say this rhyme. I say, toilet, toilet, handling waste. Thank you for your saving grace. <laughs> I love it. Because a toilet does the hardest job. It, it really does. does. It, yeah. And, and the thing is, I think a lot of the... Um, the reason why the magic of it works. Okay. The reason mm -hmm. why, why is it, how does cleaning your toilet make you money? How, mm -hmm. how does that happen? <laughs> well, like more than like saving money, um, more than, uh, I mean, not that those things are bad. You should save money. Yeah, sure. If you can, I mean, most of us can't like, or more than like not going to Starbucks or something for heaven's sake, enjoy your life, have your Starbucks, mm -hmm. wherever you have coffee, just have it. it life is short. Um, so at any rate, the reason why I believe it works, it's, it's the attitude. If you have the attitude of no matter how, no matter how successful I become as you're cleaning your toilet and you're getting in the nooks and crannies and you're, oh yeah, it's nasty <laughs> that you, you are going to remain humble and you envision yourself 
you're like, okay, I, this could go many ways. This I could always, I could be poor into old age. I'm not poor personally. You know, I consider myself lower middle class, but I'm far from poor. Um, I could, you know, I could just be the same income level or worse, but no, or better. And you, you imagine yourself, okay, what if it got dramatically better and mm-hmm. I've got a lot of money to burn. And if I do, I'm going to be giving a lot more to charity. Um, you imagine yourself in that, in that kind of elite tier by, you know, like, whoops, you know, I got there, whoops. And then if you imagine yourself just as humble and still cleaning your toilet, mm. that is the powerful magic that I believe has suddenly elevated my bank account quite considerably, you know, mm-hmm. to the point where I can eat out now. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's, it. it's because it's magical. Everything is magical as, mm-hmm. as you and I will agree. Mm-hmm. Magic is the, is the process. It, it's, I'm sorry. It's the, it's the, oh my gosh. It's the beginning. Okay. Process and culmination of intention. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's, it's, it's these three aspects of intention. Intention being the, the initial drop that makes the ripple in the pond. And so these are these three processes that grow. Every being has intention. I have intention. You have intention. This air has intention. This pen has intention. We all have a life. We all have an intention. Um, we all have, we all exist on all of these planes at once. That's why it's so hard to understand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very hard. And so with this intention, that particular intention, if it is formulated right, and if it's not formulated with this, like I want unearned wealth, almost all of these mm. these people, a lot of a lot of money magic tends to be like, I want unearned wealth. No, you don't, <laughs> right? You don't. <laughs> because you will pay for it in your future lifetimes. The problem with unearned wealth, like all these people that you see, and you're like, they're making the chatter. Mm-hmm. Guess what? That is, they will pay for it. I'm convinced. I could be wrong. But I think that you will pay for unearned wealth. It's just not a matter of now. You're just putting it off to later. I don't. I don't want it because I don't want to to earn it later. Mm-hmm. No, I don't. I don't want that karma. I don't. I. I would rather. I would rather be either this or much much less advantaged than this. I mean, it, it's not the worst thing in the world. Yeah, it isn't. It isn't. It's. It's lower middle class is, is fine. At least it keeps you more real. You know, Mm -hmm. like more in touch with, with the, just with the common people, you know, I'd rather just being in touch with like everyday people rather than Richie Rich and yeah, I mean, those people, those people are kind of scary, honestly. (laughs) So they are, and I think there's all these like rumors about yacht girls and, uh, Mm. you know, Dubai porta bodies. okay and i'm like wow <laughs> really like what why do you why why oh my gosh i mean i i, I thought you know i thought what well, all these internet people gatekeeping is over right turns out it isn't mm-hmm. so um so yeah i i just i don't want to unearn wealth i think that it's it no matter what form it comes in it's it's just it's just not a a, a, a karma that i want mm-hmm. um but yeah as far as you were asking me what are the orphic hymns right yeah, like what are because I definitely want to talk about that because that's how sure. I found you. Um, so if you could explain what they are and then how you kind of got into sure. working with them. Sure. Um uh well, how did your husband you say your husband found them? Yeah, so well actually, um, so I'll just very you know, uh I do daily planetary rituals um to all the planets. I have oh, altars yeah. wow. for all seven and in, cool. in this room. Yeah, oh, that's very amazing. cool. Um and so while I was away, I was traveling to Ireland in December and my husband um, was doing the rituals for me every day, which was really cute. Oh, that's amazing. And he was like, oh, I found. And then when I came back, he was like, oh, I found this particular artist who happened to be you um, oh. and he will play them. And he's like, They're, she's really great. And so playing them every you know day after I got back. Oh, so, that's, oh nice. Yeah. Oh, They're my gosh, very that's... cool. <laughs> that is so sweet. Okay, I better get the fire under my butt. I'm I did make an Orphic hymn to Pluto, but then I wasn't quite happy with the, the mm. way I orchestrated it. So I've mm-hmm. actually revamped that one and that one's gonna be next. So I'll make sure I get that out right away. Yeah. Um and then I'll have to yeah, if I, I, I know that 
uh, I think I've got something for every planet, but mm-hmm. I don't Pluto and I, I'm not even in Neptune is Poseidon. And I don't know that that one's easily available either. So I'll have to make sure mm-hmm. that I get those. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, uh, with the orbic hymns, I was, you know, into Druidry. So I really wasn't into the, um, Greek pantheon, but I was just kind of sitting in front of my um, computer in like 2018 or 19. And I was fiddling with my guitar and I didn't pay attention. And I came up with a riff for, uh, Mercury for Hermes. I'm like, okay, that sounds like a stolen riff from my husband because he's a musician. He's a much better guitar player than I am. He's also a songwriter. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm like, wow, that kind of sounds like a stolen riff. And I'm like, wow, how appropriate for Hermes because even I knew that. I was like, oh, he likes thieves. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So what I what I did was I'm like, well, that sounds kind of like B minor. And so I, I wrote it in and, and I was like, it fits the, the Orphic hymn. I'm like, okay, okay, let's do this. And then I, you know, I have, I'm very, very blessed because I have a full recording studio in my house. Um, and so I, I just went into that room and, uh, actually this was actually this was before this house that's right this well no no it was it was yeah I think this was but I think he was building it at the time so mm. I might have uh, recorded it in my studio where I used to have a uh, uh but I can't remember one or the other but anyway it got recorded and then I was like wait um I could write other ones of these because I write folk music <laughs> and I I know tape music so I'm like well um and then I, I would say just they were life changing. They were absolutely. Mm. There was a lot of things that that's been that have been changing my life over the years, but they were definitely one of them. I, I know that um, I, there's a book I have by oh gosh, it's by Tamara Lucid, and I think her her partner. And oh yeah, I just got that one. So good. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's a magic yeah. of the Orphic hymns, mm-hmm. and yeah, and they were so right, and they they report having a lot of synchronicity around mm-hmm. the Orphic hymns. Uh, they they do as a couple that they said that, um, it and it's a very good book, the magic of the Orphic hymns, and they talk about the history of them and what what they what they meant to ancient Greeks and, um, you know, their various translations and so forth. And when they started working with the hymns, you know, in their, in, when they retranslated them, which, which was super nice, they noticed a lot of synchronicities in their lives. Like, I think they said that, um, there's just really odd happenings. I think they said they saw an owl when they were working with Athena, Mm -hmm. like just in the most random spot. Uh, as far as my own synchronicities, um, well, I, I can't say they were as literal as that. I would say that, but, but I have had plenty of them. I have had them. And uh, I've written, I think about mm, now about 22 of them, but there's 87 in all. So I've got mm-hmm. a long ways to go. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've got, I've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> But yeah, I, and I, I live stream them on my, mm. my channel, on my Queen of Music channel. So if you ever want to see me sing them live, uh, usually on Sundays, um, you know, just whenever I get a chance, but once every week, once every two weeks, uh, it's mm-hmm. on the, it's on the, um, not on the White Witch of the Prairie, but it's on the Queen of Music channel nice. or Queenie Songs. That's right. Queenie Songs. So mm-hmm. um, uh, as far as uh Orphic hymns. I would like to see other musicians cover them. Uh, I have released some lead sheets, some sheet music, and so forth. My, I, I just want to keep them alive. Yeah, I feel like catchy little tunes is the probably the best way of of making them last because they're way easier to memorize mm-hmm. when they're catchy little like folk songs. Um, right, they are like I, I find them way easier to memorize that way. Especially Apollo. Holy crap! That thing. wow. Apollo, you mean it's it's a very complex uh words mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm, just like, I'm just like really with these words <laughs> bless me and come propitious to my prayer illustrious power meant it was like yes. whoa you know so i would have not a chance of learning that hymn unless it had been with music to it right ah uh, yeah it's, it's it's really it's really tough mm-hmm. um it's, you were asking also about um music that i was into yeah like sort of like musicians or songwriters what music you are like. you into oh gosh well i normally just say i like post-punk music which is basically 
um music from the british isles from oh, the neat. 80s yeah kind of like oh cool yeah. yeah this stuff is really cool like yeah. um like new order like new order um joy division oh Smiths. yeah yeah oh my gosh i've got some like high school friends that would be they they would be like so happy <laughs> Yeah, so I yeah I'm just, like yeah oh my yeah, gosh like, so, like old high school friends where they be like right right up your alley <laughs> yeah yes I probably know quite a few of those similar type of friends uh, that's awesome but, yeah, uh, yeah um my that was definitely my era <laughs> yeah everyone was into that back then so back when the cure was actually still touring yes yes yeah um, <laughs> and still good <laughs> yes. I, I mean, right now I really, um, just, I'm a piano player, so mm. I, I'm kind of obsessed with Terrence, Terrence Scheider, mm. who he's an autistic piano player who, who does mostly like jazz and blues standards, but he always puts these like really unique spins on them. Um, and another one of my favorite jazz piano players is, uh, Brad Meldow, Brad Meldow. I think that's, he, he, I, my favorite album of his is one of his older ones called Ode. And he usually has a trio and I really like the, I like the trio because I mean, it, it has a, he has a drummer and a bassist and then he plays piano and it's really pretty. Mm, uh, wow. Yeah. No, he's wonderful. I, and I discovered him through just like a CD I got through the library. I never would have like found him otherwise. <laughs> it was like, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, his, my favorite album again is Ode, just Ode. It's, it's a beautiful album. Mm. Um, and then on the folk music front, my favorite folk musician is probably Lorena McKennett, but mm. maybe um I, I hope I'm saying her name right um is it Moira Brennan or Myra Brennan she's like the sister of Enya oh didn't know that she's so good yeah she's a she's like a Christian songwriter mm -hmm. um, uh, but she's written all sorts of you know uh non-Christian music but I like I like both of her compositions she's just really a great composer and then Lorena mm -hmm. McKennett is just so true she's just a she, brilliant on like every single she she's just every level of brilliant like i was trying i was when we were in ireland i was um threatening my my two friends like we're gonna be listening to the mummer's dance just so you know in the car <laughs> Miranda McKenna, the whole, you know <laughs> yeah, and she's just so yeah. just quality she's just so quality every song she writes she, she does not write bad songs no she wrote oh gosh she's got one about that she's got a lot about like old uh, fairy tales mm -hmm. um there's one about oh man oh my gosh i'll have to look i'll have to look up it's it's <laughs> uh it's about like the one of the classic tales about these two sisters and the one sister kills the other one <laughs> whoa <laughs> yeah so it's like super dark and yeah. it's, 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 she's just awesome she's amazing uh, is she unfortunately, like I just have never gotten to see her live. I I, I missed my chance this this summer. I just was too busy, mm -hmm. and I should have gone. I just I hopefully she'll she'll make her way back. But she's Canadian, so mm -hmm. yeah. Back. So it's not super far away, <laughs> but hopefully she'll tour next year. But yeah. um, but yeah. Uh, other than that, uh, um, I I'm you're welcome to ask me any questions mm -hmm. that you have, but um. Yeah, yeah, I think it's slowing down finally. Yeah, I think so. I you covered pretty much all the questions. <laughs> yeah, and feel free to like cut out any chunks you need to. Oh no. You're probably gonna have to edit this, edit this no down. No way. This is great. <laughs> um I so I think sort of the, the wrapping up questions I have what mm -hmm. um you kind of covered sort of projects you work on, but if there are things you want to talk about that you have going on or um Oh yeah. yeah. Um well uh Right now I write a sub stack and which mm. is the same as my blog. It's just a reprint of my blog at mm. KimberlySteel.dreamwidth.org. Um, it's basically my blog, but without the own readings every week. So without the, the divinations every week. And they're both free. Um, the sub stack is just mainly because I would, I am never going to like harvest your email address and like have time to mail you. Like people, like people, I like to get notified via email when my, when, when writers are, are like putting something new, but mm. um, yeah, I, but I myself, am not the kind of writer where I'm ever going to be organized enough to like, oh, a newsletter. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> I, 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 it's not going to happen. Um, I'm just up to my ears already. So, right. um, but yeah, so the Substack is mainly, it's the same stuff, but it just, it's, it'll notify you when I write something new, which is, I, I usually write 
every something every week. Usually I drop it on Tuesday or Wednesday. Hmm. Yeah. Every now and then I'll drop it on a Monday, but rarely that's very rare. Usually, usually I'll drop a new blog every Tuesday or Wednesday. I take like uh, like one or two weeks off of that a year, you know. Um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and then I I hope to complete sacred home sacred homemaking and get it, you know, placed with a publisher at some point, but I'm a very slow worker, so I'm I'm gonna I'm not gonna you know promise any dates on that. I know there's a lot of people that tell me they're looking forward to it, which is yeah. really sweet of them. But um, you know, I'm working on it. I, okay. I it's gonna I think it's gonna end up being about like right now it's at it's at like forty six thousand words. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's probably gonna end up being more around fifty six. You know, mm. I'm gonna probably put about ten ten thousand words is not hard for me. Um, but I'm probably put about 10,000 more words in it. And then, then I'm going to try to get, I'm going to try to proofread it as much as I can before I, before I get it proofread professionally. And then I'm going to, um, I have it, then I'm submitted to a publisher. Cool. Yeah. Well, so, I am also one of those people looking forward to it. Oh, <laughs> really thank cool. you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And then, yeah, once it's published, I'll make sure I, I, I will come out with an audiobook because I know mm. some people prefer that. Mm -hmm. um you know i i i myself eh, I'm, I'm lukewarm on it i but i do like audiobooks but i will i will make sure that there's an audiobook version most likely read by me mm -hmm. most likely by me but um <laughs> other than that i mean i really my uh the easiest way to find me is to look at dream with i do have a post where it just it's like a link tree mm -hmm. so um uh, what I'll do is I'll put a tag in my dream with that says link tree on it. And mm -hmm. then I'll link to my link tree on it. So if anybody's like, oh, I need to find all those links that she dropped, then <laughs> just go to that one, just go to that master link. And then, yeah, it's already that, that link tree thing's already up. I just don't use actual link tree. I just, mm. I just made a tree of links and then posted yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And I'll definitely put uh, everything in the show notes um, nice. to okay. connect people with you. Um, so the final question that we have, I have is what are some words of wisdom that you would like to leave us with today? Oh, <laughs> small question. Well, um, <laughs> yeah. What's interesting. Okay. So, uh, this is post atheism, obviously for me. So I'm standing around at my piano one day and I probably should have been practicing, but wasn't. And I just had been deep in thought about demonic possession, you know, being a, an edge lord as I am, I like to, I love to watch documentaries about ghosts, paranormal mm. uh, possession stuff. It just it's always fascinated me because, um, you know, I just have my own uh, theories about it, my own hypotheses or whatever. So I was asking in my mind, you know, what when kids get possessed by demons, you know, what's going on there, and a wandering entity. Uh, who I think may have been a god. Was it Jesus, perhaps? I don't know. Uh, he, he, it, he said, if you want an exorcism to be successful, you have got to love the boy more than you hate the demon inside him. Wow. And on the surface, this this looks like one of those like false transcendence, new age, let's love everybody sort of right. Think, no, no, no. Actually, what it was saying was that it's okay to hate. It's okay. It's okay to to hate a demon, to hate things that are antagonizing you. Okay. It's it's a of course we're gonna hate the demon because it's making the poor kid vomit pea soup and that he didn't even eat. And right. He's scratching up his back and leaving obscene messages. So yeah, it's okay to hate that thing. It is. It's all right. But the secret he he said to to expelling that demon, to getting it to leave, or demons getting them to leave, is that you have to build up the love for him. You have to to again Pollyanna him. You have to look at that bright side, and you have to magnify that bright side, and then the demons will run because they can't withstand it they it's too complex for them mm. it shoves them out um so it's Dion fortune's concept from the concept from from the cosmic doctrine mm. where she says that if you want to if you want to defeat evil you you don't fight it 
it's that's like basically throwing a punch into uh it's throwing a punch into a brick wall it's just it's mm. it's going to resist you okay you just or, or if that if that uh brick is flying at you it's like getting in its way uh mm. instead stand to the side and find find the good and amplify that and when you have amplified that good within you or that poor child then that will overcome what you are opposing mm. so it, it to me um it felt it felt different that that entity and it mm -hmm. was after a lot of talking to different entities sure but it felt it felt definitely on a different level you know what i'm talking about when yeah. things feel that oh something's very very odd right now mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and then for a former atheist i'm like oh so that's what that's all about okay and nothing exciting happens that's the thing there is right that's what all the atheists are like well you can't prove it because you just in a big flash of light and, 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 and i was like you're so primitive though that's very <laughs> primitive your higher self neat world is an illusion it's all fake it's like the matrix it's mm -hmm. not really it's it is happening but it's not but it is but it's not and i don't truly understand that because but but what another entity told me i it said meat world is an illusion and then that agrees with a lot of occultists right a lot yeah. of occult and re old religions you know very old religions say meat world is an illusion they're like yeah it's an illusion uh so don't fall for it <laughs> It's it's not doesn't happen that way, and it's never going to be like Captain Obvious. Here's here's a a Marvel explosion, you know. Here's a you know DC Universe explosion so that I can prove to you I exist. That's not how it works. No, it's it's mm -mm. subtle. It's exactly what it says. It's subtle, plain stuff. Yeah. And, you know those. If you're willing to develop your brain, if you're willing to to understand that the planes are discrete, they are not continuous. That yes, it can be kind of an explosion on the mental plane or on the astral plane, but just because you 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 see the see the pink elephant or the sorry it was brown the brown <laughs> elephant doesn't mean you literally see it. Stupid! It doesn't mean mm -hmm. that you literally freaking see it. No, no, no. It's subtle, it, and it takes some getting used to. Yeah, honestly, it takes getting used to, especially for a former atheist. Right, <laughs> but it's. Yeah, I wish I, I and I hope that I can dispel all of this, you know, uh, to to people who are looking into the occult. I hope somebody looking into the occult listens to this podcast and I'm like, oh, I'm not supposed to see anything. I don't right. really have to literally hear anything. Yeah. Nope. But you certainly have to plant your butt in a meditation chair and every single little hint they give you, you better plunk your butt down and and contemplate that mm -hmm. because they didn't put it there for you not to contemplate it you know instead of sitting down uh, in front of you know tiktok and like letting the drool come out of your mouth why don't you just you know put the phone aside and then contemplate what some spirit tried to tell you mm -hmm. and then make a tiktok about it of course right <laughs> why not <laughs> as a public service yeah <laughs> oh beautifully i love it um Thanks for like wrapping like the uh, the image of the uh, loving something more Aww. is beautiful You're and welcome. then um, yeah dispelling things about the occult big thing that I'm very much all about so I love that oh so thank you Kimberly thank you're you. so great thank, thank you, you so much on. you are too and I appreciate you <gasps> yeah thank you. Your support means the world to us. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment to like, comment, and share it with others who might find this content valuable. And of course, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to stay tuned for more enlightening discussions. Your engagement helps us grow, and we appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for being a part of the Casual Temple community.